So here's like, I have two working walls with plywood where I used to like create the, the larger pieces. And then here is my sewing machine table, another one. So I'm pressed for space all the time. Yeah. Pressed for space. <laughs> and then constantly negotiating these spaces too. Um, my oldest is getting ready to come back home. So I'll lose probably that back room. Um, but yeah, so this is your, it. Your working environment and home environment, I mean, they seem so connected. And I think, I mean, yeah. it's, and I also see that in your work. Um, I mean, I don't know, I think, do you think if you moved the studio out of the home, like how it would change, how you create, how, it, how you know, the work is developed, even the work itself? They're pretty inseparable, but I feel like that's what I kind of like built my studio practice on. Yeah. Especially at Yale, I was just asking people to send me materials from home just because I couldn't afford materials. When I was at Yale, I had to, I was really budgeting because I had my home here and then I was housed there. Um, so it was just what I can get my hands on. But, but then I discovered assemblage and like what the history of that art practice and that art form is. And it, it's exactly that. It's just like sourcing materials that are ready made, found, borrowed, um, so just working with that and it worked, it clicked really. Cause like having these materials that have already lived and that are like, like just like carry a lot of meaning anyway. And then creating like that third space, um, through how I join the materials and like assemblage and like creating these objects to create a third space is like, I, I love it. I'm so glad that I found that. I'm yeah. so glad I found it. No, definitely. Yeah, because I went to school for painting. <laughs> you know, I, I, I went to Yale because uh, for painting, I thought I was going to paint. Maybe I will one day, but like it just didn't happen there. Yeah, and how did it change then, like after Yale? I mean, how did you, I mean, well, one question I have is even just how you started making art. I mean, where did the, the kind of interest from art come from? I think I found, well, I've always been like making and as a kid and drawing and those things, you know, like I wasn't ever groomed to pursue art um, as a career or profession. I wasn't, um, we didn't go to museums, we didn't go to galleries. It wasn't like something that um, I knew in that way, but I feel like I, I started when I, I found painting when I was at um, the University of Oregon during my undergrad. I found painting my last, my senior year there and I was like stoked. And also I saw that, um, cause I double majored in art and ethnic studies. Cause as soon as I found art, I just like took all the classes. Um, but that piece, uh, it will always stick with me. Couple in the Cage by Guillermo Gomez Pena and Coco Fusco, Coco Fuco. Um, that piece like changed the way I saw art, the performative aspect, the materiality of it the gesture um, and they were implicating the audience based on those things. I felt like it was, that changed the way I saw art. And then I, after that, I wanted to pursue like a, a practice. I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to see what that was. And so after the University of Oregon, I came back home to here. It was my first time living on my own. I uh, was single mom. I had my oldest with me at that time, just one, one kid. And then I lived on the river um, worked for my tribe in their um, public information department with a cousin of mine. Uh, we did the newspaper for my tribe. And then also at that time, I was like trying painting in the, in the studio, which was also the back of my house. <laughs> and then I built up enough work. And then I applied for a program in uh, Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand. And it focused on uh, Maori indigenous arts, but also, or contemporary art, but also I, I, um, focused on indigenous visual arts while I was there. So then I just applied with that work that I was doing in the back of the house, the painting, and then went there, got my master's there. But it just wasn't, it wasn't what I needed. That program just, it, I think a lot of the times like indigenous art happens like in, things, things that it happens in a vacuum, like it's not informed by other things. So you're just like really like narrowly looking at, um, art in that way and it just wasn't because that's not my experience as an indigenous woman um so i just came home i was i produced a body of work 
that I, it's, it's still more, my favorite to this day. It's a really powerful work that I feel is powerful. Um, I came home and then I decided like, I wanna be a mom. I wanna focus on growing my family. And I had um, an experience at the, who was it, the Smithsonian? I don't remember the acronym, but it starts with an N. It's like specifically for native art and like that collection. Oh. But like, I just was not impressed with how they were. Mm -hmm. I just felt like it was really static in the way that they were performing Indian. The participants, I felt like it was really static in the way that they were seeing Indian. And it was really static in the way that they wanted to um, show what kind of art was coming out of our communities. And so like, I'll tell you story. Talking about the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian? Yeah. Was this at the Smithsonian you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, it was at the NMAI, I think it's called. Can you, I want to be like specific on that specific place. Is where the, <laughs> is it like in the financial district in New York where that big bowl is? It's down there. This was like okay. years ago. Um, and I was uncomfortable. I didn't have my words to express like how I was feeling in a way that like would translate um, well. <laughs> so I like, I was just like, you know, when I get up and talk about my work and I present my work, I'm uncomfortable. Um, and then, so I was like, I'm gonna sing you guys this song. And it's, it's saying only, it's sacred. It's saying only once a year, it's hella Indian. And then I was like, happy birthday to you. And they were just like, ah, you know, like they thought they were getting you know, yeah. a piece of something that I didn't want to perform or like I didn't want to, that's just not Indian for me. Yeah. Um, that's just not my experience as an indigenous woman who's black and Indian. Um, and they just, I, so I, I did that and I just said I wasn't impressed and why I wasn't impressed and how I was feeling. And then I just left art after that. I came home, um, I didn't produce a body of work for like five years after that. I had another baby. I was a mom of three after that. Um, I was learning how to hunt. I was learning how to, what foods to eat off, off the land. I was learning where our water sources were, our, um, our language. I just took a break. I didn't think I was ever gonna come back, honestly. Cause I just didn't know that there was like a, a bigger art world out there. Cause I had learned art, like really, it was really, narrow and then I decided to return to it five years later but I, I just couldn't figure it out because I was working providing for my family um I just didn't know I just I didn't have the resources to to develop a studio practice so I was like man I'm gonna google the top five programs uh in the nation for an MFA and like go and I did that and then that's how I ended up at Yale and that's it was like a really pivotal point in my in my practice like yeah blew my world up it like it, it allowed space for me to like come through in my entirety as an artist it allowed me to broaden my audience allowed me to get out of the native american art world even though i got a lot of love there there's a lot of pushback there because it's you're expected to perform and to produce a certain kind of work a lot of the times it becomes formulaic yeah. um so it just allowed for me to come through um, and talk about the work I wanted to talk about and the experiences I wanted to talk about. Um, but it also pushed my practice. It also pushed the materials. It also pushed how I was communicating like to the viewer. Mm. So, and here I am. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I was quite interested, Natalie, in um, reading about you adopting a a framework of autoethnography. Yeah. Um, is that something that you 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 did when you were doing art and ethnic studies, or was that at Yale, or how did that come about, and what were you, you know, how does how does that relate to your practice, autoethnography? Yeah, it's it's been just something that I've been doing before I had that word for it. You know, just building this archive, this visual archive. Um, since I was younger, of just like where I'm, where I come from who I come from, but it's a lot of work because uh, a lot of stuff hasn't been documented. Um, and it's just merging who I come from, where I come from, um, the places I come from, um, knowing that a lot of that stuff hasn't been documented and a lot of that stuff isn't um, available. 
Uh, so it's always been something that I've done, but like when I was in ethnic studies, um, Jose Munoz talks, talked a lot about it and he talked about it in a way that was like, it's not, autoethnography is not interested in the truth. It's interested in disrupting the truth with a truth. Um, so that's how I come to my work and to you as the viewer with um, autoethnography. Like, I'm not trying to like convince you um, that of my truth, this is just what I'm providing to you as like a microcosm, as a small part from the whole. Um, but it's always been autoethnography a part of my practice because it's I just believe that it's important to know where you come from, if you can know, if that information is available to you because there's a lot of like erasure um, that's happened you historically. You mentioned about, thank you. You met, I was quite intrigued by um, assemblage, assemblage. Yeah. And because um, you know, obviously, a lot of your work has has been influenced by that, and you talk about that. Where where did you discover assemblage? And and I guess the other question is, how does that relate to your concerns around autoethnography, around narrating your experiences of you know of um, identity, etc.? Because I mean, that comes the the assemblage tradition is quite an interesting sort of tradition um, that I think there's only limited understanding of it. I've had a bit of experience of working with, um, for example, African-American vernacular artists and um, so-called artists that are untrained, etc. cetera. And, um, and, you know, so there's a, there's a history of quote unquote assemblage that started well before the kind of art historical accounts of Rauschenberg and yeah. you know Jackie yeah. Johns, etc. So I was wondering where you know where did you where do you come in in terms of you know assemblage? Is that something that you know what I'm saying? Is that yeah? <laughs> Thank you for asking that because I like really want to talk about. Well, I knew um, I think Jimmy Durham. Do you know Jimmy Durham's work? You know and how he Absolutely. I knew Absolutely. him. As a, yeah, I knew his work before I knew assemblage. I think just being honest and just my and just trying to be honest in my work, um, it's just knowing this idea of assemblage through culture because I, I think I've always been exposed to this idea of joining materials to create something that's infused with meaning, that's used in like um, in ceremony, that's used in, intimately in the home, things that are private that aren't really like exposed to um, public. It's like a really like family community object that's infused with meaning and that's used to be um, created within the community and kept within the community. But like, I didn't know assemblage, like the, the, um, the formalities of it, the history of it until I got to Yale. And then I, and then I was really interested in how that was playing out in black communities, communities, especially like in LA and like how, and then I was like Pope L and then I was just like Outer Bridge. And then I, it just, it just made me feel so like warm inside that these things were already happening um, through ancestors. It was already happening before me. It's gonna happen after me, but it, I think it's a part, a huge part of culture and how I connect to ancestors. But I saw when I was at, I think I was at the Met. So when I was at Yale, I had all these, like you are given access to things like I never, heard, I never got a no at Yale. Like I, if I wanted something, they'd figure out how to get it for me or they would like put that person in your studio. So like, it, it just blew my mind, like how, like how heavily resourced this space was. And then I now had the opportunity coming from where I, from where I came from. I was older, I was in my thirties at that time. It just, it was a really hard, but beautiful experience. Um, where was I going? Oh yeah. So I, I, they started using the language um, of power objects in my practice. And so a big part of my being at Yale was like learning a language around my work and like building one. And so I was like, well, what the hell is a power object? And then I went to the Met and then there's a whole collection of collected objects that are these assemblaged objects from like different cultures, especially Africa, um, South America that are power, considered power objects. And I was like, oh, that's what they are. Like, that's what I was seeing um, in ceremony. That's what I was seeing in the home. That's what I was making already. So that's where I'm coming in at. And then I'm using then assemblage 
in creating power objects then to create that uh, third space to talk about indigeneity that's full of intersectionality. And then that's where I, that's like where I'm coming in at. And that's what I'm offering, um, but it's not, I'm not trying to teach you. I'm not trying to learn you. Um, I'm just trying to create these objects that can hold their own without having to know any, any, anything about me, where I come from. Just hopefully, hopefully that you can feel some sort of viscerality or some, you can feel something from it and you can engage with it formally even. So that's where I'm coming from through like assemblage. And like Jimmy, he's not even like native. He, came, he was like exposed when I was at Yale because he had that huge retrospective at the Whitney, you know? And I went to it because I used to send him letters because I was like, man, you're Indian, I'm Indian. You're talking about like blood politics. I'm talking about blood politics. Let's like politic together. And like I sent him like letters, like handwritten letters for years. It wasn't like every day, but it would be like maybe once every other month if I was feeling it one month, maybe. Did you get replies from him? Did you have a dialogue? Oh, he never. Mm -mm. He never did, and oh, now I know his speech. Like, yeah, but then yeah. like okay, and then like but I love his work. Like I saw his work, and like I'm just it. I love his work. And I'm, I'll show you this piece in a minute. Um, so I was like, Yale is heavily sourced. They're probably not gonna tell me no. And I was like, can you get me Jimmy's contact information directly, his home? <laughs> and I got it. <laughs> and I still have it. I didn't contact him because he never responded to him. He never responded to that violence that he I feel like what he did is a, is, a, is a kind of violence. Like he held a sort of space. He took up a sort of space um, that didn't belong to him. Was it as clear cut as that, um, yeah. Natalie? Yeah, it was, okay. Man, you claim something in Indian country, you better have your, you better have your <laughs> blood on them. You better have all your, you better have, you know what to do. And if your community's not claiming you, if you can't claim blood quantum, and if your community's not claiming you, and if the tribe that you claim sent a letter out saying they're not claiming you, you ain't in it. You ain't it. Wow. So, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to um, get away with that in Indian country because identity is so heavily policed. Like you, you, you know, and he got away with it for a really long time and I'm not sure how. But I'm impressed by that. I mean, he was like, he's one of the most famous contemporary artists. And as you say, all of his work is kind of based on, you know, his identity is Indian. I mean, I've seen, as you said, I loved his work. I saw, I first saw his work in Paris in the, the Museum of Contemporary Art, a huge yeah. solo show, massive solo show of his work. And it blew me away. I was like, wow, this work is just incredible. But as you say, you know, and then all of that, I mean, does, do you think that, does that, the fact that he's not authentically Indian, does that take away from the power of his work or how do you, how yeah, do you? Yeah. It does. Yeah. It does. Cause it's like, he's a, he's a white man, right? Uh, uh, a white man did that. Um, yeah. You know, like, how dare you do that? Like, come, come through. You're already privileged. You're already going to be famous anyway. Why do you got to take that? Yeah. Um, and he claimed AIM, you know, American Indian Movement. And my dad was in that. And he was like, I don't remember him. Um, <laughs> oh, I, also, I didn't realize it was that. Um, yeah. It's that deep. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it stings. But also, um, we should just keep it pushing. Because also, I'm, I'm interested and invested in, invested in um, challenging Indian and challenging blood quantum. Yeah. And I feel like he did that. He created a space for that. Um, he occupied the space that we could have been we could have been in, but I I'm, I don't um, completely disregard his whole his his work. You know I'm I still um, go back to some of his work. I have a book right here that I'm using um, as a piece um, in that I'm working on. So I just feel like it's a conversation rather than to just totally like ignore him. I feel like it's a he's a convert. He's something that we should be talking about as we push forward. Yeah. Um, but he's never apologized either, and I feel like he should have. I was waiting for that apology. I think apologies matter. <laughs> yeah. I'm just interested in holding space for um, not him, but I'm interested in holding space for the, the ones that are coming up. Um, 
So if I can be a part of that conversation with Jimmy and with like these other artists who are in like the, the vein of assemblage, then we're gonna be all right. I was also really quickly curious because your work, it also has this really interesting combination between, you know, in the assemblage, you know, the hand stitching, the very kind of um, ancestral materials, the, um, you know, very, you know, whether it's shells and um, bullet shells and real shells oh, yeah. and wood. And I mean, but then you also have all of these synthetic materials and very kitschy materials. Mm -hmm. And if you could just talk about the relationship between those two contrasts a little bit and how that, um, yeah, I don't know, relates in your message or, yeah. I just, I just feel like it's, um... I'm not sure. It's just it's just these materials are where I come from. I come from uh, an urban and rural communities, two communities, um, and these are materials from both of those spaces. Yeah. So I feel like that's it's just um, it's just literally from these spaces. Uh, so then I, I I gather, I'm given, I buy materials that, yeah, are from these spaces and from my experiences in these spaces. Um, like the football, you know, jacket letters. Yeah. And, and that's about like spectatorship and that's about like performativity. Um, and that's about performance of Indian really. Um, and thinking back to how we, I think blood politics is constantly in my work and I won't ever, I don't know if I'll ever not talk about that until we're not dealing with that. Uh, I don't know if you know about like blood quantum um, and like the a little bit I'm educating myself yeah. about it. Can you talk us a bit about it yeah yeah if you could tell us that would be yeah it's like um in order to be recognized there's a whole history of it and I feel like it was like in the 1700s the government established it um how they explain it it's like oh it's weird blood quantum you have to be a certain blood pedigree to be Indian to be part of these um, to be registered with these, these tribes but it's also, it's just, it's genocide. And they say it really like simply, but like the actual effects is to like eradicate is to like, you end up disappearing because if you can't keep this blood quantum at a certain standard, if you're just living your life as a human being and out there and your blood quantum is like lowering every generation pretty soon, you're just not Indian by their standards anymore. Um, but my tribe and during the Dawes Act, it has a lot to do with the Dawes Act and like history but to keep it like simple and short, like there's most of the tribes in the United States um, determine their uh, membership, their citizenship based on this blood quantum. And everybody has um, different like pedigrees, like fractions, one fourth, one eighth, 16th, just all different kinds. And, and it's um, some of it's based on like matriarchy, their, their mama side, it's all different, but my tribe, uses it as a standard too. Even though we're sovereign, we still use this way to identify through blood quantum, which is like a government tactic. And we have the choice to get rid of it and to define community and membership old, the old way, um, or we're not doing that. And so my a lot of my work is talking about that. Similar to Jimmy, like, I feel like he's more abstract and like really poetic about like, Indian and like these things that he's talking about because I don't feel like he's like lived it. So he had to come at it that way, right? Um, but my, my stuff is like factual, like this is what I'm dealing with um, and how that plays, in, plays into like who I choose to have kids with and like having that conversation. I did a body of work called Mama Bear 2 um, and was it last year? 2019, I did that body of work. But that's just like, thinking about those blood politics through motherhood um, I have three children, two are enrolled, one isn't, but then also blood quantum. If you don't have this tribal ID, then it limits your access to your homelands. Um, you can be in trouble if you're not um, enrolled and you're out here hunting and you're out here doing what your ancestors did. We disagree with it. I disagree with it. I'm raising my kids to, to, to talk about identity and who they are outside of that even though we engage with it, but we also are navigating it um, too. Like I have this space, I have this home, right? I have tribal housing because I'm enrolled.
because I've enrolled my blood quantum into my tribe. And then, then I get benefits. I'm protected in a certain kind of way. Um, Can I ask a, a bit a question about the blood quantum? So it was effectively made up by the American government, not by the communities. Yeah. Themselves. So obviously it came out with a particular way of thinking about race, which was uh, yeah. common at that time. Um, for example, yeah. African-Americans were declared three-fifths of a human um, in the mm -hmm. initial uh, construction of the American Republic. So you can see that these kinds of... But I, I must admit, I thank you for... This is really educating me very much in this. I wasn't, I didn't know about the, the blood quantum. I'd always assumed yeah. that those ideas came from the tribes themselves. But actually... We keep know, them. Yeah. We keep them. It's just like, we, it's just this huge constant battle. Like it was up for, well, also like, I feel like it helps. Like I'm really privileged to be able to come from another community. Like my being raised by like a black woman in a historical black neighborhood in Portland within a native community. Like I coming from that, I know another way of belonging. Like there's, there's a different way to belong to community and to a people that's outside of blood quantum. And I've experienced that. Um, and not all belonging happens around blood quantum in our communities. Like there's lots of different instances that create community, but blood quantum is like the daddy. Yeah, I just, we had a, ch we had a chance. It was up for, like, you can't vote in my tribe unless you're enrolled. So my oldest, she can't vote, even though she's like heavily involved in like politics and she's um, in school and she's wanting to like engage, but she's like, it stops her from like engaging completely. Um, but we had a chance to, um, blood quantum was up for discussion in our tribe a few years ago and we, it was like a huge debate and we, um, voted to lower it. Um, and then that increased our numbers, um, who were enrolled, but I was a descendant for most of my life. I was not enrolled for a while for until, until like 2013. So it's just something I talk about. It's something that affects me, affects my children, affects the way I move, affects what I do with my body. Uh, has it, It's funny. It's like, ah, it's blood quantum. I know it's like petty, but race is like a social construct too, but it has like serious implications. It has serious, serious implications. And like, I feel like we should be talking about that. And so that's what a lot of my work is about when you see like, um, those Chanel lettering and like these idea of um, mascots maybe and letterman jackets is like the the performativity of um, Indian. Um, Natalie, um, it's not it's super fascinating. I, I mean, I guess moving from blood to water, yeah. I was just wondering what 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 you make of obviously that's the Verbier three D residency a theme that you're responding to, but I just wonder what water means to you yeah me in your practice culturally you know what how you're kind of addressing it in the context of the residency yeah I'm not sure yet I just chose oh. um I'll get there <laughs> yeah. but I just picked water because it's um we're fighting for water um at home uh we are go ahead son we it's huge water is life I know that um that was very, that was made, that was made public. That was made, um, a, people were made aware of water is life. I feel like when Standing Rock happened, um, um, but that message, that message has been around. We've been fighting over water for a really long time. Um, and indigenous people in America specifically. Um, and right now we're getting ready to sue the government because of um, they're letting well, it's a huge fight. It's been happening before I was born. It was happening before my dad was born. It's just, we're just locked into this water fight. So I don't wanna like have to teach, but um, we're surrounded by water. We're the people of the lakes, the marshes, the rivers, the creeks, like water is a huge resource for us. Um, and we have a lot of then um, farmers that came in and they are um, heavy on like cattle. And they're just like, just destroying our, our water. They're like, make, there's a, there's a, the Sprague River gets really gross in the summertime. We like to swim there, but the cows are just the cow piss. 
and it's just it's just making the water warmer our fish are getting sick everything is just off um a lot of our like fresh springs are drying up because of it they're um pulling from like the underground the the groundwater illegally and now our um lake we can't access our lake it's it's dangerous it's toxic if we get it on us the, the water the umbo then uh, we can get sick we can't fish from it um they took our salmon away. There's a dam, so we no longer have our food resource. It's just, and now our chuan, we have this like prehistoric, um, beautiful sucker fish that I think there's three, two to three different kinds, but now they're endangered um, because of the water quality and because of the farmers are illegally taking the water. Um, and, our, and their water, which is mainly like the lakes and the rivers are, they're sick. And so, our story is once they die, we're dead. And so we are, the government is supposed to be protecting us and like protecting them as an endangered species. And they're not doing that. And they're not holding these farmers accountable. The judges aren't. Um, we had that huge wildfire this summer um, and they were pulling to fight the fire. They were pulling water from our lakes our lake and so that was even like lowering the water level it's just it's a huge it's fucked up really like that's how I can explain it it's like it makes you just uh disgusted sad uh angry yeah because um water is life and like how it's 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 violent it's extremely extremely violent and you are telling me that I don't matter and my children don't matter and um my ancestors didn't matter. You're telling me that by doing this. And I just, um, we're fighting for water. So I don't know. I think my time with this residency is going to help me um, see outside of what's happening. Cause I'm just in it. Like, right. It's just like, it's in it. We're in it. And I feel like I'm, I'll be able to ask questions somewhere else and then pull from that something fresh here because I, um, I'm, I'm down, I have to protect my home. Like I'm down to protect my home and like maybe from it, I'll find another way to artistically protect my home better, you know, I'll, um, through art. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm committed to my practice. I'm committed to my communities. I'm committed to um, my family. And so I, maybe like something that I'm gonna pull from here, this time, this research is gonna help us here, you know? Maybe I'll I'll maybe I'll build like an, an a suit or something like a, like a water suit <laughs> that's like some sort of armor. I don't know. I don't know. I'm excited though to like kind of get out of this um, all what's going on here, you know, because we have to walk a certain way when we're at odds with the farmers and the government. It's really important that we protect ourselves when we're out in public. So yeah, I'm excited to pull from this residency. Um, some something fresh, pull myself outside of it a little bit. And I also think even too, I mean, I also think Switzerland can learn from you, from your experience. So I even think that conversation of you coming out of it, but also, you know, even could be um, a warning to, I mean, Switzerland very is protective of its water. It's very bragging about its water. But mm. there are also things happening and especially water as a commodity now and yeah. selling of water to other, you know, I mean, there's yeah. so much happening. So I think, yeah, I think, you know, we will also learn a lot from you. So I'm really also thinking this. And I'm like the worst indigenous person to learn from sometimes. Cause like, no, I'm not trying to get an extremely I'm, helpful. I'm not, I'm not trying to like teach you, you know, I'm just, I'm, this is my coming of age as I'm like, coming to it you know I'm just and you're living I'm it. making mistakes I'm yeah I'm living it I don't I'm just coming as I am yeah um, but hopefully like something really cool can come out of this time I'm spending with uh, Verbier and and you and and you so I don't know what that's gonna be um I know we're all living through like a pandemic and but I'm excited to produce something Cause like water is definitely life and um yeah maybe i'll i have an idea so maybe i'll show you these these um these places that are extremely like sick and like these places who these places that are still healthy and 
I don't know, maybe I'll start showing that. Cause like, once you see these cows, it's, it'll blow your mind how gross it is and right. how they just, and how it's just gross yeah. and it's just not sustainable. I think what you'll see when I'm showing you the terrain that I'm like mapping, you'll see just how it's not sustainable at all. Like their agriculture and their ways of, he's outside son, and their ways of um, farming and like, it's just, it's a joke. It's just crazy how they think that they, this is sustainable. Um, and also I feel like it's really important that um, my tribe was like, man, we're trying to help you guys live too. Uh, even though you are on stolen land and our treaty is definitely broken, but we're trying to figure out how we can all like live right now because um, you can't live without water. Yeah, definitely. Well, no, I mean, that's been, yeah, so great, Natalie. I mean, thanks for sharing with us. Yeah, your your home, your practice. Um, yeah, your personal space, but also really, um, yeah, what your work is about and, and um how you navigate everything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I wish that you guys can come see, you know? There's something about like um, being here. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Well, that's yeah. also why we, we do, you know, that's also part of the residency. I mean, we do want to see, you know, we want to experience as much as you're willing to share, I think. Um, and not only just to see the development of the work, but also just to, because yeah. you're so open and honest, it seems with your work, with, you know, your Instagram, with, with everything. And I think as an artist, yeah, a lot can be experienced from the public or from, from everyone who experiences you and your work. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's important right now for sure as well. All right, you guys, All right. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.